the subject of today's speech, I'm going to call it a speech, because it started off as a thought, and then it went into a philosophical thing, then I had to hack away at it a little bit, till I came to where I am. The brothers sell Yosef. They feel self-righteous. They did the right thing. They came to Besdin, and they paskin on the Ischai of Misa, and then they ate bread. Why did they eat bread? Because they did what they were supposed to do, a good day's work. They paskin the shah they're supposed to do. And this week, they get themselves into trouble. They say, oh, this is all because we did the wrong thing. We sold our brother. Hello, guys. We didn't forget what happened last week. Last week, you were so sure that it was the right thing. Did they have harata that they sold him or not? So what are they talking about this week? That they caused him pain. They threw him in the pit and they caused him pain. That's what they were concerned about. They should have given him a, a shot of booze beforehand. That's the title? Maybe. Maybe. Okay, so why didn't they give it? That's a good question. They, that's what they regretted, that they caused him pain. Okay, all right. I'm willing to accept that answer. I'm willing to accept that answer. But that answer is really a, a serious question. I'll just mention the Gemara in Sanhedrin says that when a person is chayv misa, so they actually give him a drink beforehand. According to some, the source of the uh, minig that you say l'chayim is because of that. Because the person was sentenced to death in Bezden, so they were mashtin they were, gave him wine to drink beforehand. So we say that the wine that we're drinking now should be l'chayim, not like the haruge Bezden, that that drink is for l'moves. That's, that's according to some, that's the course. And just for those who would like to know something um, uh, historical, those people who clink their glasses together and they say cheers, do you know where that comes from? I challenge. I'm going to tell you where it comes from. In the old poison. times, it was, what'd you say? Because they're afraid of poison. That's right. And what, the, and what happened when you jump in the other It mixed the drinks together. Okay, so we're going to go down together, right? So when I see two Yidin, when I see two Yidin um, clinging their glasses together, I think what a, or, what a bunch of horrible people that the Cheshed uh, fellow next to them for me or the Emma, right? But who knows? I don't think that the average person thinks too much about what they're really doing. They just, they just um, are doing chukas agai, if you want to call it that. This is not a very non-Jewish thought, not Jewish source, and it's not something that good Jewish boys should be involved in, poisoning other people. Okay. Anyways, anyways, um, here we have the case, and I believe that Ellie's on the right track, that the psak was right, but they were missing compassion. That's what it says in the Pasi. They were missing compassion. And um, I'm not such a good guy. And I don't, I don't have, I used to have a computer. Uh, I used to have a dictionary in my house and I can't find it now. And um, in preparation for this year, I was trying to find the connection exactly between two English words, which just one is a growth on the other the word passion and compassion, okay? Well, it seems to me, I didn't check it out because I couldn't find my dictionary, that passion is you have a strong emotional feeling and the word come is a joint, right? So when I have compassion, that means that I feel for your pain, so to speak. I have a passion that comes, you can check it out, Levin, to see if I have it right. But I believe, is that correct? Do I have it right? You can check it out, but that's what I believe. That, uh, what? I'm trying to look it up. To see. Okay, try to look it up. Yeah. But I believe, I, I don't think I'm that far off. At least none of you, Balpad, know better than me, so that at least I'm not, I'm not a big Amaritz, okay? When my father, Arena Kaporsi, Arena was in Yeshiva, so he told me there was some Bokram that broke into the kitchen, 
and stole some food. And they tried it. The cook shouldn't find out about it. And the next day, the cook figured it out. And it came screaming at them, what do you think I am? I'm just as smart as you, you dummies. Right? So, <laughs> so, so uh, I say, as long as nobody caught me, so I didn't do such a terrible thing over here on this, this definition of passion and compassion. But anyways, Ra Mr. Lipman, am I correct? Do you think I'm correct in my definition? Yeah, the, the uh, pre, you're talking about the prefix C-O-M? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that indicates a, a group, a company, co right. community, a company of the co communal correct. camaraderie. Right. right, it means that it's a grouping together. It's what I have compassion for you. That means that I am together with you in your emotional struggle. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe that that's, what, that's the technical definition of it. But anyways, anyways, so I have over here, uh, one side we have their complaint that they did not have compassion. And on the other side, there's Hanukkah, which is a fight of passion. And we spoke about this a little bit, a little bit last week. And there's a medrash, a shachar tov, that I'd like to share with you. And it's gonna put together, Mitz Hashem, Hanukkah, and this week's Parsha, and put us in a place where hopefully we'll understand how to deal with our emotional struggle, so to speak. The Madras tells us that there was a man who was some kind of a bandit or something, and uh, the king's men got him, put him in jail, and started to beat him up. And the fellow realized that if he doesn't think fast, he's not going to make it through the morning. So he said, I'm the king's, one of the king's best friends. You better leave me alone. This is a medrash, Shachar Toiv, Simen Chofei. Just one second. Let me just, maybe I'll... Dover Acher, I'm reading to you a medrash. Elokai Becho Batachti. I have betochen you, Hashem. My sab echad shayesham adam gadol, vahayelo isham medina, vahayesham adam echad shayesham ya medina, umasa achsana yecha betasu. They found somebody, put him in jail. The Omar and the person who was put in jail said, Al takuni ki ben beisa shabalachani. I'm one of the kings, you know, ben bias, someone was over there. Ki wach esham okay, since they heard that. They left him there in jail until the morning. They brought him to the king. We found the guy, one of your friends. The king looks at the Melech and says, You, 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 you don't look familiar to me. How could you say that you're one of my friends? You don't, look, you don't work in this country. What are you doing over here? No, I really don't know you, the king, at all. How do you say you're Ben Basi if you don't really work here? You don't do anything. I'm like, I really am not one of your friends, but I have been talking to you. If I wouldn't have said that lie, they would hit me. So I had no choice to think fast and say that I'm part of the king's entourage. So the king said to the people, since he had betochen in me, and he chulo. Let the guy off the hook. Since I had betochen in you, don't let my enemies get, get gang up on me. So this madrash, I heard somebody explain this madrash. That it says over here, it says over here something fascinating. We are Mispal Takarish Bokh, we should help us. And somebody says, so I should be Mispal Takarish Bokh, should help. Who am I? What do I deserve? Kadosh Bokh is not going to save me. I just don't have enough schusim. So this measure says, if you have a talk on Kadosh Bokh, and you say, you know, I'm one of your guys. 
and I know if I'm saying I'm on your thing that's going to save me, that could be enough of a sport to have the person be saved. This is what the, this measure says. Now, so the person has the passion, and there are many people who normally are, don't have the passion rise within them. Sometimes they come to a situation and a volcano explodes within them and they act super religiously far above the way that they act the rest of the year. And um, people say, you're a phony. This measure says that even if you are at that moment, genuine, that's enough that it can cause your life to be saved. That's what the measure says. On Hanukkah, you know, we think about the Maccabees' unbelievable dedication, Monsieur Snefesh. It's not, and this is something which is amazing, it's not really fair just to think about what they did. Imagine if you were a Kaddish Baruch Hu, okay? You probably have to get a new size suit because it'd be much bigger than you are. But anyways, imagine if you were a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So you have 12, 13 guys that are great and the rest of the nation is assimilated. Would you save them? They're, 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 they're human beings. And that's not enough. We learned from Ninveh, just because you're a living being, that's not a reason to save them. Here you have, and I, I just, let's, I want to I want to set the record straight. And I don't mean to say anything negative. If the Second World War would not have happened, what would have happened to Jewry of Europe? Probably assimilated like in America. The, with America, Baruch Hashem, we're not yet assimilated. But well, the, the, the there are Jews, yeah. But I'm saying, but there is, but and, and in Europe it was going much quicker than it is in America today, right? So you want to know if it's a blessing in disguise? You know, that's like a very hard thing to to call that a blessing in disguise. But but in a certain sense, there is some kind of a. So did Klai Yisrael deserve to be saved during the Second World War? Imagine if you were a Kodesh Baruch Hu, what's the answer to the question? You don't think so. Okay. So I'll tell you something. I'm going to tell you what I really believe. Um, I really believe this, and I'm not saying anything against anybody personally. I'm saying something against the general population. I don't believe, you know, I don't know how many million uh, hundred thousands of conservative and reformed Jews there are in America. You know, there's some vast number of people that are affiliated with those institutions. I say that it's Shekhar Vachazov. They're not conservative and they're not reformed. They are ignorant and they're struggling to have a Jewish identity. There are no conservative and reformed Mispalim. They're only conservative and reform rabbis. The people are just paying people that are Jewish, looking to have some kind of a religious connection. They don't have the foggiest idea of what conservative or reform halacha is. They're not religious. And I'm sure that all of you people no dozens of people that fit into that exact kind of a uh, thing. Lev, is this true? I would say for the vast majority, but there are for the vast majority. Yeah, obviously there, there are, are some that are, you know, they go on the conservative or the reform sheet of it, and they know what yeah, they mean. Yeah, but most right, but, say, but the most people are just there because they're there. You know, there's right. a famous when I was a kid. When I was a kid. So they used to say this joke about uh, this is before the before the Iron Curtain fell, that there was uh, in class in Russia, and they said, you know, Victor, stand up. Who's your father? So he said, Stalin. Who's your mother? Mother Russia. What do you want to be when you grow up? A cosmonaut. Okay, fine. 
you know, then they say, you know, um, Alexander, what, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? So he says, you know, a scientist, you know, who's, he goes, then he comes to uh, the Jewish kid and says, who's your father? Stalin. Who's your mother? Mother Russia. What do you want to be when you grow up? An orphan. That's what... <laughs> So, you know, that there's the system out of, of, uh, of society, people just fall in step and they're not really there. They're just not there. They're not there at all. This is a very important nikuda of, um, so the Hellenists, many of the people, and I believe this is true to a certain extent, many of people that they like the glut and glitz and glitter of, of, the, of the culture, but did they really turn their back on Yiddishkeit? Could be not. What will be the, the proof of the pudding? Well, Rabbi, what about the Misiavni? They certainly turned their back on Yiddishkeit. Uh, they're, they're always the conservative and reform rabbis. That's what I'm telling you over here. Listen to the question. You, Ellie, just wait one minute. Let me say the question, and then we'll see if you have an answer. What will be the proof of where these people stand. The average person in America, we'll call that, you know, the assimilated Jew of America, who probably, as history would put them there, like the Hellenists, you know, right? Even though it's what I just said right now, I don't think that's, that's a fair, a fair um, label to put on them. What will be when there will be a showdown between the two societies? Where will their sympathies fall? Where will their compassion be? Will it be with the religious Jew? Or will it be with the non-Jewish religion? I think it's going today towards the non-Jewish religion. What? No. No, 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 let me explain. Let me explain to you something. One second. I, I, I'm not arguing with what you're saying, but we're not at the exact same spot. Mm -hmm. Okay. The there is a lack of understanding, bechlal of what Jewish religion is, and today, being a Catholic, a Christian, a Buddhist, you know, whatever religion it is, to the American, it's all a joke. That's not a, they don't see any of those things as religions that have any kind of binding anything. It's just a comfort zone, what is closer to it the way I live today. But the average person in America is so engrossed in self that he's not willing to move an inch in either direction. But deep down, they feel Jewish. The Jewish pride is still there. And I believe at least what happened at that time, it's true that the Maccabees were the ones that fought the war, but were the Hellenists fighting against them or were the Yavadims fighting against them? Who was the enemy? There definitely was, if I'm not mistaken, historically, there were also Hellenists that were fighting against them. But I'm talking about by and large, Okay, but that, that might be just the Hellenists. The America is changing more and more. Yeah, well, the, the America is changing. But in America, you see the... the I, I don't really want to speak about America because I have sort of the opportunity yeah. of running for president. You know what I mean? But, right. uh, <laughs> but America, America has moved off the page of any religion altogether. It will not be more than another 10 years, I don't think, before they take the words of God and trust off the dollar. I think it's going. You know, it's America was always a religious country, mm -hmm. so there was freedom of religion. The religion, um, and I'm just making this statement because it's important in the context of what you're saying, as bad as the assimilation of Yiddishkeit is in America, I think that there's a church closing in America every, I forgot how many seconds. You know, it's, what? Yes, but they, they have their own the new religions. The, um, no, 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 the new religions, those, those you want to call them those grassroots fundamentalist religions come and go. 
those aren't those aren't mainstream. That's like the third party, you know, Democrats, Republicans, and Independent Party. You know what I mean? These are not these are not real real uh, things to be concerned with as of as of now, at least. But I'm saying they're not that those aren't really religions that have taken off. The Ku Klux Klan still is not running America. You know what I mean? It's just not it's just not it's just not happening yet. And let's hope it stays that way. But uh, there's no guarantee. But I'm just saying the, the bottom line is that Americans are not into religion because it demands. All religions demand, and Americans are not interested in delivery. They're only interested in pizza deliveries. They're not interested in delivery. That, that's, that they're just not interested. So anyway, this is the point that I just want to say, that there is an idea of Hanukkah. We celebrate passion. We celebrate the Maccabees' passion that no matter what, and this is what we spoke about last week, we're going to fight for what we think is right. And it's not a question of win or lose. It's, we will, I make a statement about what we think is really important. Klal Yisrael applauds that. Even those who are non-affiliated applaud that even today. I believe that that's true. So we have a question, are we chayev or are we not chayev? So there's a question of how could you sit there and watch your brethren suffer? Even if they deserve it, <clears throat> how could you be watching? That was a taina on, on the brothers. <laughs> if you don't have compassion, so then you're missing a fundamental in Yiddishkeit. That's which they came to recognize themselves. So it's not always a question of what's right or what's wrong. It's a question of what, you know, there's a, a famous line from the Chazanish, which I'd like to share with you. Somebody asked the Chazanish if you're allowed to use Hashmal on Shabbos. And he's answered, that's like asking me if there's a safer Torah burning, can you light your cigarette from the fire? What was he saying? The halacha is saying, not the important question. That's right. No, sometimes the halacha is just not the question. That's not the question. There's something far greater than the halacha that's at stake. You know, this is a, I remember when I was a bocher, somebody asked the mashkiach of my yeshiva, if you're allowed to go ice skating on a, on a, on a tainus. Is there an iser? No. Are you allowed to? Yes, you're allowed to. But, but it's, it's not in the, um, it's not well, in the realm spirit. of the spirit, exactly. So, so how could you ask such a question? I was once, I one time had a Kodesh Baruch Hu, um, uh, many times, but so one of the times I had a Kodesh Baruch Hu, give me a pinch on my cheek. The following episode happened. I was at a Leviah of some lady who was, I think in her 90s when she died, and was walking away from the cemetery so a grandchild was walking with me and says, Rabbi Zchash, I'd like to ask you a question. I said, yeah, what's the question? He said, my best friend is getting engaged tonight. I want to know if I'm allowed to go to the engagement party. So I told him, I explained to him why it's insensitive to want to do that, etc. And then I just added on at the end, and it happens to be also Rabbi Halacha also. You know, just a minor a minor uh, thing. But first I explained to him that it's an insensitive thing to do. And then that was the end of it. I forgot all about it. Two weeks later, the child of the lady who died comes over to me and says, I want to give you a thank you. So I'm always willing to take one of those because they don't come by so often. So I said, uh, yeah, what for? So she says, I was there when my son asked you that question. And I wanted to bop him over the head on the spot. But I couldn't do that because he would think that it's because I'm in pain that I want him to suffer with me. So I couldn't tell him anything. And I'm very happy that you set him straight. 
Okay, that's a, that's a true story that happened happened uh, not so long ago. And, and I, I think a lot about that story, right? Because if it wouldn't have been a halacha, it wouldn't have made it any more or less right, so to speak. You know, this person has his priorities mixed up. Sometimes it could be that one has to kill his own brother. You know, Levi, after the Chela Egel, had to kill their brothers. That's what it says in the Torah. Do you think afterwards they made a Suras Mitzvah because they were Makayim of Mitzvah? But we'd be our Torah in Kibbecha. I would imagine that they didn't. I didn't find any Mamre Chazal that says that they did. So, the uh, just the, the joint lesson between the Parsha and Zois Hanukkah is that you have to have the passion and you have to have the compassion. And sometimes you even have to have the compassion for the person who did the wrong thing. And I'm going to end up with a, with a Gemara. The Gemara tells us about a certain Amora, if I'm mistaken, it was Amora that there was a sheep that was being taken to the slaughter and the sheep try to go under his skirt to hide away. And um, he said, what are you hiding for? This is what you're created for, to be shechted. And the Gemara says he was punished for that because he was being callous. What he said is true. I thought so. What? Did not the brothers of Yosef after they sold him, don't we say they sat down and made a suda? Yes, I did. I mentioned that. Right. But I mean, isn't that also, that's the part of the sin. That's, that's, exactly, the that's what they came to realize that that was the wrong thing. That's exactly what it says in this week's Parsha. Right. Sometimes that's what you have to do, but it doesn't mean you have to be proud of it. That's exactly the, that's exactly the point. You know, when the, when the father has to give his son a potch, who does it hurt more? Father, Lou. That's right, but it doesn't have to mean that doesn't mean he has to not give the potch, right? You have to give the potch, and it has to hurt you more. That's part of growing up. You have to be responsible. Anyways, this is the kudo which I just wanted to share with you this week. That it's very important sometimes to even have compassion when he deserves it. Because he deserves it, doesn't mean that you don't have to have compassion for him. I think it's a very important lesson. This is a lesson that we learned from the Achim of Yosef in this week's Parsha. Shall have a good Shabbos. Nice, nice seeing you. And Zayis Hanukkah should be meaningful to all of you.